Uh, money makes the world go round, up and down. Money makes the world go round. Then you're out on your ass. Uh, hello, welcome to Pop Culture Maniacs' this podcast. Um, as usual, it's me, Kieran Fremantle, and uh, Jean uh, Heenigan. And we're going to be talking about f- uh, movie franchises and um, particularly cinematic universes. So, Jean, how are you? I'm doing well, Kieran. How are you? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. So, yes, we. As um, you get gathered with my um, little introduction, I have the view that, I think, hardly a revolutionary view. Yeah, franchises are there to make money for studios. Yeah, and I actually tend to agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I think um, particularly what well, over the past 10 years has been the rush to make cinematic universes. So, um, the ones I could uh, think of, obviously, MCU, DCEU, MonsterVerse, um, Wizarding World, and then you get um, more um, failed attempts like the Spider-Verse, the Dark Universe, um, the Fox has attempted to do an F- X-Men um, and Fantastic Four crossover. I think, obviously, um, and the way the mo- movie industry has evolved it used to be that you had to earn a sequel i so either critical praise and financial back uh financial backing and now it's uh it's more like they just think the studios are thinking let's go let's just prepare for a franchise without doing any of the leg uh leg work yeah it seems like now um everybody has you know an order for more movies you know, i remember when uh the solo the star wars story came out you know everyone was like this is gonna be the next star wars franchise and then it wasn't so now it's more of um a shock when something doesn't spin off into some sort of franchise and there's also the sense of shouting and freud when you when um, movie studios invest lots of money and then they fail uh, fail hard oh yeah, yeah. absolutely Yes, so uh, I was because I was thinking like, um, well, I came up with a list of some films that they seem to be much more focused on making the next film in a franchise than actually telling a story of the here and now. So a few examples, um, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, um, The Mummy, as in the 2017 one with Tom Tom Cruise. Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald, and even though Marvel have are one of the better ones, even they are susceptible because they Iron Man Two and Age of Ultron were more focused on setting up future films than again telling a, a cohesive one-off story. Yeah, and you know, piggybacking off of the Marvel thing, um, you know, I've been writing about their TV shows lately, and yeah. I've noticed a similar kind of thing where. I think particularly with the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, they're more focused on setting up the next movie than they are about telling the story that people thought they were going to be telling. Yes, yeah, and I think, um, I'm sure we will talk about Falcon and the Winter Soldier at some point, because um, whilst I enjoy it probably more than you, yeah, I agree that it's, I think it really should have just been a film. It shouldn't have been at six, uh, uh, six episodes of TV. Or a six hour movie. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Just been do it like well, very quickly, um, quick diversion, or you know, do like do the Netflix or Amazon model. Just put put it all on in one go, so people can binge watch it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but anyway, so yeah, so and um, so, so back to movie franchises because I think um, they used to be a lot. A lot rarer. Obviously, you can think of like um, like nineteen thirties and forties. There were a lot like the Universal monster films and things like that. Um, various versions of Sherlock Holmes over the years. Um, Bond series, obviously, one of the famous ones. Started the movie started in the sixties, but again, they were more few. They were um, few and far between. Really, there wasn't like if you made a one off good action film it you help go something like the rock like great action film from the 90s there's never there was never any plans to make a sequel out of it yeah i mean stories were, were self-contained 
and yeah yeah studios weren't locking down actors for six picture deals right off the bat yeah the, and i was thinking like um if we pretend if we lived in an alternative universe where star wars was never was unsuccessful like of finance, especially financially, and there was never any drive to make a, uh, a, a to make sequels. You could at least say that the first Star Wars film work would still work as a one-off story. Yeah, and you know, <clears throat> it's very clear watching it that you know, even though George Lucas had the idea for a, a trilogy of films, it is a self-contained story, and it ends with an actual ending. You know, so that by the time you get to the second one. And I remember watching it the first time. I was surprised that there was a cliffhanger because the first one was a self-contained story. So I was expecting one of the same. That's sort of a model that sort of worked for other franchises like Pirates of the Caribbean. First one, again, works as a self-contained story. Then the second one obviously expands on the universe and ends on a cliffhanger as well. Yeah. And, you know, I might be a little nostalgic, but I, I do miss the the feel of going to see a movie and, and seeing a story and not seeing, you know, part one of 20. Yeah, yeah. Um, with some films, again, like, say, Mark Cinematic Universe, I think at least they generally have the right, they have got the right knack of telling a self-contained story whilst also having, like, a few little Easter eggs for future um, future films or just, you know, saving the setup for the post credit scenes. So, uh, it's a, like, something like Doctor Strange or Guardians of the Galaxy, they work by themselves. Or something like Ant-Man, as I said, it's, uh, you know, it's a small slice of the bigger pit of the bigger world. Yeah, and with those films, um, you know, like kind of, you know, like our Wonder Woman, which is essentially a standalone film that introduces a character. You can tell that, you know, something with like Guardians of the Galaxy or Ant-Man are some of the more, you know, out there properties within, you know, Marvel or, you know, presumably DC if they get their act together. Um, you know, the studios are, are hedging their bets on it, and you can tell that it's an intro to this character. And if it works and it takes off, then the character can be fully integrated into the wider universe or you can get a sequel, but they're not pushing their luck. Whereas opposed to something like, you know, Thor, where, you know, arguably the first Thor isn't as good as something like Thor Ragnarok, but they knew they were going to keep Thor around because he's such a core character within the story they're telling. So, but the weirder ones, you know, studios seem to be Here's a self-contained story. If it takes off, awesome. We'll keep going. If not, well, you know, it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, yeah. As you as you touched on, obviously, there's a lot of um, the way you think contracts are working now. It's a uh, feel um, a lot of studios offer like multi-contract, multi-film contracts to actors. So here, do three or like Samuel Jackson, didn't he? He started like something. He like had something like a nine film deal or something, didn't he, with Marvel? Yeah, I think he had one. I think uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Evans both had real long contract deals with them too. Yeah, and it is also you see here in like announcements of films that um, they're planning on making a trilogy. Of uh, when we talked about DC, we talked about J.J. Abrams' his, um, Superman film, the, the Superman Flyby. Um, because that was meant to be the start of a trilogy. They were planning on a bit of a trilogy. If you read the, the, the script online, they even make references like certain characters are introduced just so that they would be important for the next film. And um, you obviously think something like um, Terminator sequels. You've got uh, Terminator 3, um, Salvation and uh, Genesis. They're all meant to be a star of a trilogy, and it's ended up being a trilogy of failure. Yeah, they're never able to capture that same magic again, you know, despite yeah. attempts and, you know, really good actors that they're trying to put together for it just never works. Yeah, yeah. I think with something like Terminator, I think it's just, well, you would have thought it could have worked as a one, again, worked off as a one off story. And you know, with um, Terminator 2, it is one of the best action films ever made. How do you top that? 
Yeah, and I think that's definitely a problem that some of these you know franchises run into when they have success. You know, they can't maintain it, and it starts to fall apart when you know certain pieces of the puzzle don't want to come back for another film, or you didn't lock down enough people with contracts because you weren't sure it was going to do well. But and then it comes back to you know studios' goals are to make money, and if you have something that works. You know, their, their MO right now is to just drive it into the ground until it stops being profitable. Yeah, that's the, the Simpsons. So the Simpsons model. Yep, the Simpsons model. Uh, no, I think you sort of touched on it point you out. With some uh, films, they were never meant for a... Uh, they were just meant to be a one-off and they haven't been able to recapture the magic when they have sequels. You either... I've had one thing like, so like the, the old trend was a sequel was pretty much the same film to the point that they even lampshade it, something like Die Hard 2 or uh, Home Alone 2. Or you get uh, films that they, they are just meant to be, a, they were like a one-off cool idea, but they don't know how to expand it like Predator. Ironically, I'm all, these are all Fox films, <laughs> which I just realised whilst I was saying this. Yeah, I mean, uh, Fox, even more recent times, seems to be having serious issues with, or before they were bought by Disney, no longer exists, but they seem to be having some issues with trying to keep generating the same story over and over again. Like, even with X-Men, yeah. they desperately wanted to get that Phoenix story, and they still can't get it right. Yeah, now it's Marvel's turn. And I have faith that someday it'll be done correctly. <laughs> yeah. Or it's also something like, for me, I think the best sequels tend to be the ones where they they obviously honour the original whilst continuing the story. So to me, Aliens is one that I think is the perfect example of how to do a sequel because, again, as I said, it honours the original, continue, doesn't change anything from the original film, uh, but it, it expands the world shows the next step of the four, the characters, and obviously with Ripley, obviously having the trauma and obviously, obviously having her sort of surrogate mother-daughter relationship with Newt. And it was a genre change as well. It went from claustrophobic horror to um, full-blown action film. Yeah, and what you pointed out there when you said sequel is I think really the key, is that making a sequel is very different from making the next movie in a franchise. And so when you're making a sequel, your goals are very different than, you know, when you're making, you know, something in the MCU or, you know, Star Wars, whatever standalone movie they claim it is. You know, your goal is to do exactly what you said, which is continue the story and keep the characters within the same kind of area and track. They were in the first film, but make it different enough that it's not the same movie. Yeah, yeah. This, oh, it so back in back in the day, um, planning on making a multi a multi film franchise was actually considered a massive risk. So some, it was very rare for someone to actually commission a sequel straight away. Something like I think rare exception would have been something like Superman, Superman and Superman Two because they were back to back. And even that, and obviously we all know about the history of Superman Two being in, like with Richard Donner being fired and all the problems that caused. Yeah, exactly. If we go back to something like um, something like Lord of the Rings, or like that success sprang sprang board, like um, pretty much studio Hollywood studios looking at other proper, other like say fancy novels that they could adapt into um, into franchises. So obviously Disney had Narnia, a uh, Fox tried Aragon, and then say something like Twilight and Hunger Games success, sort of. Look at we had obviously had after Twilight success, lots of um, sort of similar sort of supernatural um, romance stories, and Hunger Games. We obviously had the trend of YA dystopias. Yeah, I mean, as soon as one idea hits, you know, a million more pop up, and you're seeing it now also on TV with the success of Game of Thrones. You know, every network decided they wanted to get their own Game of Thrones which led to, you know, Amazon's huge, huge purchase of everything um, Tolkien that wasn't already owned by New Line. And, you know, it's this idea of now it's become 
less about creating stories for studios. It's more about, you know, gobbling up IP that they think matches with whatever trend is existing currently in film or television. And then you can argue like with something like Game of Thrones success, because that sort of um, has died down quite, quite considerably. So, or you know, because obviously the lackluster final season is sort of pretty much dulled um, interest in Game of Thrones. It's not really talked about as much anymore. Yeah, and HBO still has one series in development and they still have a couple other options that they're discussing. Yeah. And so they they did, are... yeah, and I was gonna say they did think they were planning on making the Long Night series, but they 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 nipped it at the um, pilot stage. Yeah, they they've had a lot of issues with you know continuing the Game of Thrones IP, and I I'd love to find out what actually is going on behind the scenes if the pilots really are bad or if they're just nervous now that they don't have the right people involved to to push it across the finish line yeah. in a similar way that they had with Game of Thrones. Small tip, um, small tip for any TV company: if you're making a big budget TV show. Don't hire guys that don't have never show run before or have much TV experience. And check with them before you do to make sure that even if the ending hasn't been written in the books, they still know what they're doing and care enough to finish it. Yes, exa exactly. I was gonna say, um, another example, just thinking like The Walking Dead, because that, that span off into so many big um, show ideas, because obviously you've got the, you've got, Walking Dead Prime, shall we call it? Then you got like the Fear the Walking Dead. Then they had that other one that got really trashed. I kind of don't even know the name of it, but the one where it's meant to be like set, like the next generation that would have grown up with zombies. Yeah, and they've got the Carol and Daryl spinoff coming now that uh, Prime is ending. And when um, Andrew Lincoln left the show, there was all this talk they were going to do a special Rick actual theatrical film release series of a couple movies and I suspect that's never going to happen now no to be honest with something like Walking Dead I think well I loved it up to season four and then I think it's just generally I got up to the back the middle of season seven and lost interest that's about the same with me yeah going back to sort of um, film franchise because I uh, something like um because uh, re recently I watched a Sonic the Hedgehog movie because it, it was, you can argue again, that story was fairly self-contained. Sonic gets trapped on Earth, wants to have, wants to have a fa family, stop the bad guy. But they did clearly have another eye, uh, had an eye on the future as well because like, there were like lots of like the early references of Sonic's old home world that he gets attacked by kid, a kidna, so hence Knuckles would probably appear in the, in the future. And obviously they had the um, post-credit uh, or mid-credit uh, scene with Tails, so hence um, sequel bait. Yeah, I mean, and Sonic is a potentially huge property and a lot of people around our age really loved it when we were growing up or at least familiar with it they had a cartoon series and everything so I absolutely understand why they were trying to, to make Sonic into, into something but I think I think that was one that was pretty much doomed from that first uh trailer that came out oh I, I, I joked when that came on came out I said childhood ruined yeah, between that and cats, it was a heck of a year for really weird trailers in 2019. At least they, at least they had the well. So poor animators had to be locked up and have to be forced to redo the whole, all the special effects. Yeah, and it still didn't help cats. <laughs> oh no, no, I was talking about Sonic. Well, yeah, true, very true. <laughs> it's all uh, thinking like um, let's see. Um, Family Guy, like they had to see uh, a moment where Brian here's uh, thinking about. Uh, he basically takes Stewie's ADHD medication. It makes him really wired, and he says, comes up with like this big, broad idea of a um, of a multi of big franchise. And you think again, writers really need to. I can understand that with writers, they get a bit of world builders disease. I I mean, I've had that myself, but you got to make sure you got to tell a good, 
to narrow your focus, especially if it's your first first story. Yeah, I think one of the big things people forget, even if they're working with well-known IP, is that you want to get as many people as possible to watch this. And in order to do that, you have to make sure you create exposition that doesn't feel like you're just throwing it at the audience. And you have to create characters that people want to pay attention to. You know, simply saying, well, this is Batman and expecting everyone to accept that and know who it is and know exactly what makes him tick isn't going to help anything. So unless you ground your story in an actual arc and give us characters we care about, it's not going to matter how famous the IP is or how much you expect everyone to like it. Yeah, and if you're thinking of like a lot, um, obviously the recent, the trend in the, uh, during the north, the 2010s, like, um, like I said, the rush to make cinematic universes, if you want to sort of like hilarious, but it's like dark universe starting up the the mummy film, which obviously flopped badly, or like to, um, 2016's Ghostbusters, they had, um, it was something like Ghost Corp or something because they were planning on making a big um, Ghostbusters cinematic universe and obviously fell flat on its face. Yeah, I mean, the Dark Universe one was really one that got me. I'm like, you want to make a cinematic universe out of, you know, the mummy and the wolfman and Dracula. Like, really, that's that's what we think people want to watch. Like, and that was when I couldn't quite understand what the purpose was. You know, for the most part, these are villains who are trying to kill people. So why do they think people are going to want to root for these guys throughout the whole course yeah. of a cinematic universe? Yeah. I was also thinking like with something like um, with, say, comic book, book movies as well, obviously with Marvel and DC, because obviously they are the sort of like the more natural, um, they're more natural or a fit for a cinematic universe. But if you, obviously with like comic books, it was a slow evolution for them, for all these characters to fit fit in together. It wasn't like they went like back back and said, so let's make Batman Batman and Superman, um, a, a Batman and Superman crossover straight away. Because obviously like with DC's, um, they were like various different comic, um, comic book companies that, that slowly were slowly brought together. And again, and with Marvel, it was sort of sort of more of a slow. It was a slow integration before all these um, characters to get together. Yeah, I think within the different the DC and the Marvel cinematic universes, that's the key difference there too, is that in Marvel they slowly over several years built up, you know, characters. You had your Thor movie, you had your Iron Man movies, you had your Captain America movie. You introduced you know Black Widow. And you got to the point where everyone was familiar enough with the characters, even people who weren't familiar with the comics, then you can bring in the Avengers and then, you know, build there. Whereas with DC, it seemed to be more slipshod, more, we know we're going to get the Justice League movie, so we need to get there as fast as possible. So we'll cut the corners and not do what Marvel did and just do a couple movies and go and move in. And I think that might have been one of the key missteps in, in the overall creation of their cinematic universe. Exactly. Yeah. So agree with you on that that front completely. I think probably the standard view, isn't it? Mar- Marvel had the slow build up. DC rushed it too uh, too quickly, and then uh, obviously it fell fell apart very quickly. Then yeah, I think um, the other way to go with franchises is um, I would say would be the J would be the Bond series because. Most of those films are, are standalone. You don't. You could watch most of them individually. You, obviously, and most of them you can sort of jump on quite quite easily. Like Casino Royale is obviously a great jumping off point for the rebooted series, um, and it's a series that constantly reboots itself anyway. Yeah, and I feel like it's somebody who has, I don't have a ton of Bond familiarity, and I've really only watched the more recent series. Um, but I feel like even with the more recent one, from my understanding, is it's more serialized in a way than past Bonds have been, where you've had a clear arc with this Bond, you know, and you've, you've seen points, and particularly with 
the final film coming out. Yeah. And there's gonna be callbacks to his other films and it's more integrated into a, a story for him as opposed to more like standalone adventures that he goes on. Yeah, because uh, there have been like the odd few that do have followed on from each other. For, um, from uh, Russia with Love was did have continue certain elements from Doctor No, of a uh, the there were in the first few films there was the whole spect spect was always that lingering threat. Of uh, Diamonds of Forever do make references to On Her Majesty's Secret Service because On Her Majesty's Secret Service had I would say one of the best Bond Bond the best endings in a Bond film and. Quantum of Solace was a, was the rarity of being a direct sequel to the previous Bond film. But I, I would say the problem with the serialization for the Bond films is, is it, particularly with Skyfall, Skyfall really shouldn't have been integrated. It was made as a standalone film and then they sort of retroactively tried to make it a part of a bigger, a bigger arc. Yeah, I mean, I, personally, I loved Skyfall, but you know, more Judy Dench, the better, is my opinion. But yeah, it, it definitely felt like it was, you know, kind of the next movie in, in, in a franchise. Like it felt like, you know, it felt like it fit in in a key place and it was meant to tell a story that was built on previous films and that kind of situation. Uh, as, as I would say, though, because uh, Skyfall, I think you could, people could watch that individually. But then, as I said, because um, they didn't make any references to anything like Quantum or Spectre or anything like that. And then, as I said, and as I said, they sort of, it was sort of tried to be shooed horn in, like um, so suddenly um, Silver's mi mission of revenge against um, M became a part of a wider plot of um, Blofeld trying to bug, um, screw up Bond's life. Yeah. But yeah. No, uh, yeah, I think we've um we spoke quite a lot about quite a lot of franchises and um the reasoning behind it. So um shall we shall we call it an end on this subject for today? Sounds good to me. Yep. So uh, listeners, as you know, please like us, subscribe, follow us on various social social media. Um uh, thank you very much for listening. Cheers. Bye.